The title of this evening's talk is Digital Deputy Act, a commitment to digital ethics by software professionals. And our guest speaker is um, Rafael Baca or Rafa. And Rafa is a US patent attorney for um, many years and also has a second life career as a software engineer. And uh, well, uh, he'll, be, he'll you know, talk about um, uh, creatively how that um, works out, uh, having experience in both, both of these worlds. Um, first, a little bit about um, our San Francisco Bay Area chapter of the ACM. We're founded in 1957, and uh, our goal is to promote knowledge of modern computing. And um, we are a support community. Uh, we offer um, resources and help um, for software professionals in, um, in uh, seeking uh, employment opportunities. Uh, we have two meetings every month. And um, the first is general computing, which is generally on the third Wednesday. And the second meeting of the month is um, related to data science. Um, and that is uh, typically on the fourth Monday. So our chapter um, is put together by volunteers, um, both in time and um, financial resources. So we encourage everyone who is uh, a software professional, whether front end, back end, um, just, just so many um, areas to please support us, uh, become a member. Uh, it's only $20 a year. And um, to sign up, simply go to sfbayacm.org and you'll see a join. Um, uh, join button and your uh, your support is very much appreciated. I wanted to bring up a couple events that are happening. Um, the first one is um, a talk about um, the alignment problem. This guest is uh, Brian Christian. He has a new book out and uh, um, we've, we've had him on uh, before. He is a visiting scholar from uh, UC Berkeley. And so that event is happening on Monday, November 23rd. Another event uh, we wanted to highlight is um, our PDS, Professional Development Seminar. And that is uh, scheduled for a weekend uh, of December 12th and 13th. And the topic is Natural Language Processing with PyTorch. And um, we've had uh, these uh, seminars before. This one will be really a, a nice one. It's gonna be um, hands-on, not as uh, deep theoretically, but just really uh, you know, offers the ability for people to, um, to run an application and go through it. So um, that's gonna be great. The cost is uh, $125 uh, for the two days of instruction. And um, we're, there's going to be a promo codes for ACM members as a benefit. So keep an eye out uh, for, for that event. Uh, as is normal for these events, um, for those who are attending, if you do have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to uh, click on um, the question and answer or raise hand and uh, we'll try to either uh, get to the question real time or um, further on in, in the talk, um, we'll, we'll try to uh, bring that up with our, with our guest speaker. And so with that, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg Makowski who will be introducing our guest speaker. Hello. So Rafa is a practicing US patent attorney and software developer in Silicon Valley. He's got a master's in computer science and data science, a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. He's the current national chair of the American Bar Association, Artificial Intelligence and Robotics Committee, and Big Data Committee. So he first became interested in decentralized computing and software development at Stanford University's Bitcoin Edge Initiative. And he's never looked back. He develops AI-based software tools and has built several secured online platforms for caseload management and document automation. He was a US PTO patent examiner in the medical device group and has gained experience with software, robotic and AI systems, as well as digital privacy law. So please help me give a warm welcome to Rafa. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I, I appreciate your time and um, 
this opportunity here at ACM. As a, as a student, um, I, I was an ACM member and now as a professional, I, I continue to be an ACM member. Um, historically, ACM uh, has meant so much to the profession. So I really appreciate this opportunity. So uh, the topic of the talk today is really about the Digital Deputy Act and what is it and how does this promote ethics, right? Digital ethics. <clears throat> I think a lot of it has to do uh, with my own background being a mashup of many disciplines to have encountered this vision that I have and it's embedded in the Digital Deputy Act. So let me explain. Um, for quite some time, I was a, or I still am actually, a, a, a patent attorney in, in primarily in engineering, so all different types of engineering. I just uh, completed in 2018, as Greg had indicated, my, my master's in computer science. And the most important thing that um, I went with an open mind and at the end, I, I, I was really in, interested in natural language processing and, and big data and, and those tools and data engineering as well. And as I was going through my coursework, I just noticed um, having a different perspective as an attorney, um, but yet as a computer student, computer science student, I was just noticing just some of the tools that we use for, for data science, um, for big data tools to, to create data lakes. And uh, I, I kind of questioned, you know, uh, of how they were being implemented in terms of knowing data privacy laws. And they're, they're, it, it left a lot of questions in my mind because um, at on one hand, uh, software professionals are always interested in helping the world become a better place. So inherently, even though there might've been some potentially um, questionable in terms of legality, acts that were going on, there was no knowledge of it. And as it is right now, we're in this period of kind of like a digital wild west where although we do have ethics and we do have some laws at the implementation stage, right? Um, I don't, it, it became very concerning that I don't believe everyone across the board of the entire software development cycle was aware of what is legal and what is not, right? And so I, I kind of went on this journey and I, I as a blogger, I, I wrote a lot of articles on just uh, what is actually a, a norm and what becomes a law. And uh, it kind of helped me, you know, I was doing some soul searching as whether what we were, what I was doing as a student was illegal, but, or wasn't it? Because ultimately, you know, it, it was, it, it's kind of creating these things. So there's kind of this gray area that we are in right now, right? And so from that quest, there's some things, and we can actually see it in politics today, right? But what are ex exhibited as norms in society, in this case, in digital society, um, when there is a collective need for norms to kind of um, move forward and be more solid, then that, that's kind of what ends up being the law, right? So we're not at that place yet. What I found was even more interesting though is putting my lawyer hat on Lawyers are extremely regulated. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, lawyers, by, by contrast, are, we, we take a bar exam. We must be able to pass the bar exam. We must be able to sit for the bar exam, which requires you go to a three-year institution. Once you pass the bar exam, um, 
part, one of the components of the bar exam is ethics and professionalism. So you, you actually study that. Um, then after you pass the bar, though you're, you, the state license you, or well, the federal government in the case of the patent law, right? They license you where it, it needs to be renewed every so often, right? And in the case of a state license, it needs to be renewed every year. So in addition to a fee, you have to have some proof that you've actually gone through some coursework. And this coursework, usually there's an ethics and a professionalism component that is required to have been completed once you are, you know, you do your application for, for renewal of your license so that you can continue your livelihood as a lawyer, right? So before that though, lawyers weren't regulated. In fact, there was no such thing as law school. Um, as I understood it, this was before I was around, but as I understand it, um, uh, uh, like a lot of other things, the law was actually an apprenticeship. And then, you know, they kind of standardized it and made it a, a, a three-year post-grad degree, right? And they had a bar exam. Uh, but the way I saw it, interestingly enough, computer science is still kind of it in of its infancy in that in that respect, right? Um, to me, uh, I did see, and it has been noted, and I, I have written about it that sure there are certifications in ethics. There, you can be an ethical hacker, right? You can actually just uh, sign a registry online, but there really isn't a, a legal certification process. Why is this important? I think a lot of it has to do with, let's, let's look at it from a policy perspective. And not only does this have, this is very similar to, to lawyers who have a, a license that they need to renew every year for their livelihood, but also engineers have the optional um, at the end of their graduation period to actually sit for kind of like a bar exam where they're, they have an optional professional license, um, but they have a professional license that's granted by the state as well. And it, I think between the lawyers and, and the engineers, it shows there's something at least in software that is to me, inherently, that is, it's not there yet. And what I believe Digital Deputy Act provides is a legal certification for licensure. Why is this important again? I ask this again. And the key thing though is, I think a lot of it boils down to this. When engineers build use tax money, right? To, um, for a project that would be the construction of a dam, a highway or a bridge. They're using public money, of course. So that's the people in general, right? But there's also, in addition to that, there is this, there is this note, um, kind of a sense of accountability to the greater public that if they can, if they have this this particular project, they are put at a higher standard so that the public is protected. And I believe that's that's what we're doing too, even in data engineering as it is now. But there is no linkage to the the greater public good. I think a lot of the certifications as they are now, they're not. Um, you're not necessarily beholden to the general public as users, but, but more or less to maybe the certification bodies, whether it's Microsoft or Oracle, whoever there is, but that, the, it never goes any further than that. The benefit of actually having a, a license is a, a, actually a fewfold. Um, the, the benefit is for at least engineers, let's just use this because it's an optional process. And this is how I would envision the digital deputy would en envelop the software, software professionals, 
along the same ways as maybe an engineer, um, is that it's an optional process, but by its virtue of having taken a test, having education on a yearly basis, right? And there is, this, um, there is an ethical requirement at the, on the test that they need to have and also on their yearly educational, they have to have an ethics and a professionalism. So why is this important? Well, in the context, interestingly enough, and we'll see here with the actual ed edits that I made to um, the existing uh, engineering licensing exam to include software professionals. Interestingly, as it is, there is no law right now that seems to include software professionals for state licensure in anywhere in the country. That's very interesting. And, or, or, or to bring any software professional into the conversation along with lawmakers and lawyers and law enforcement on how to implement digital ethics and, and data privacy. So I find that very interesting. Um, so back to the engineer example though, the idea is primarily is to have the software engineers being included as an optional license. The ability also that similar to an engineer for example, a civil engineer, when you have a bridge and you sign off on a bridge, you can take on certain public projects. It allows lawmakers also to implement greater standards, ethical standards in terms of best practices into handling um, perhaps in our case, data for that the general public has, right? Um, the other thing too that I find that's very interesting is that with the, the licensure in of itself, it allows you to become a, a consultant in the, the truest sense. You can actually hang out your shingle and thus lawyers do that. And professional engineers as well, there's a lot of consulting firms that are sanctioned by the, by the state to have their own their own group as a consultancy and what can consultants do, right? They, they actually can take on large projects. They can also become expert witnesses in, in court. Um, there might be even uh, the ability to, to be advocates for, for legislation that helps with ethics in the future, but also with, with data privacy, right? As it is now, they're, there is a disconnect. There is no sense of where I feel that a, a software, although they, a software professional, although they definitely want to help and they are building the infrastructure of the internet, there is no, there is no dialogue as it is with lawyers, with lawmakers, with CEOs of software companies. So, that is that is the thought. So to try to get it as close to uh, um, as a professional engineer as possible to for firstly to be able to have or to, to create a, a legal licensure, but also to be able to advocate as software professionals, very much like engineers, very and and to also follow. A, a, a stricter code of ethics, just like a lawyer, professional engineers as well, among, although it's optional for professional engineers, there is this uh, sense where um, a professional engineer has greater esteem among their colleagues because they have gone through extra rigor and um, to have gone through the process. Also, the employers tend to look for and they pay slightly higher than other engineers if you are a licensed professional engineer. 
and there's actually a license and there's actually a, a website on the benefits of being a licensed professional engineer. Why do I feel that software engineers can best uh, be fit in this particular law? Well, as it is now, as it's showing on the screen right now, some of the amendments that I provided. So um, if you don't mind scrolling um, down, uh, there's essentially here, this is amendment A. So there's two laws going on right now. So the important thing is, uh, if you can continue to scroll until we see a red highlight, there we go. So essentially we can stop there, thank you. So first of all, the act as it is now. So imagine if you will, if this is the lowest hanging fruit. In fact, it would not require having to write a completely new law over again, but by amending the existing act for engineers to include software engineers and to define them, that's, that's gonna be important because that's gonna require a committee to help discuss on what is truly a software engineer so that in the legal context, it would also include computer scientists and IT professionals, right? Um, that's, that's the key. And, and interestingly, the act, it has everywhere from nuclear engineers, it has soil engineers, it has all these different, it even has geologists that are listed. There's, that are under this board that have um, for the license, right? To get your professional license. So it's engineers, geologists, and surveyors. So it's all technically trained people, but again, they have this licensing power so to be able to sign off on some things that are required by the government. And of course, with that higher level of scrutiny that they're doing this for the benefit of the public, right? The public good. Um, but interestingly enough, I, and I, I, I have no idea why software engineers or software professionals for that matter were not included in any law in, in any place in the United States as it is now. So I took it upon myself to add these um, additions to include software professionals as a list to be able to sit for the professional engineering exam as an option. Um, historically, I, the only way that, the only reason why I maybe can come up with a hypothesis on this is perhaps the profession really kind of came gangbusters, right, in Web 1.0, um, you know, like at the turn of the century, and maybe just a lot of the politics right now, they're not doing a whole lot, right, and things just, I, 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 I am just really perplexed why this was never added to the law as it is now, right, but this is the best time to do it, right, so that we can become part of the profession, at least I feel that way, right, uh, to be able to have a dialogue on to what, how to implement ethics, um, even into, here's a key thing. Um, this actually happens quite interesting and I'll, I'll remain on focus again, but I, I wanna share this one thing that I think it's a very telling information why it's important to have at least uh, uh, a license regime and also ethics implemented in it. For example, I see this a lot in software where you may have an employer <clears throat> that is going to tell you to do X, Y, and Z. They may by all means not be informed of all the digital privacy laws that are out there, but they're going to tell you to do it, to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and you're gonna do it, right? So you really don't know if it's legal or not, but you're, you're just gonna do it. Similarly, and this is where I think it's very interesting, um, in-house attorneys, they're not, not necessarily beholden to their employees. So say if you are you know, an in-house attorney for a Silicon Valley company, if they're is some practices that are not ethical or maybe not even legal. 
the attorneys, their attorney's ethical requirement based on their license is to, if it becomes a concern, to report that to a higher authority, whether it be internally within that company or maybe even to the state. And in this, in this case, the attorney general, right? So there is um, having, as an attorney, an in-house attorney, they're constantly every year being educated on ethics and the latest things, right? And the latest, the latest amendments, the additions to the laws in, in particular manner. So they're well informed of what is ethical, what is illegal, what is legal. I believe that similarly software professionals, in this case, software engineers through the Digital Deputy Act can behave in the same manner, right? Say if you know your employer may not be all that completely educated, you are educated as a licensed professional on the ethics on a yearly basis. You know exactly what to do and you know if there's a concern who to report to, right? Um, these things are really important. And at the ground level, through the software development cycle is I think where it needs to happen among a lot of other places. By the time, as I mentioned in the website, by the time um, lawyers get to it, that's after the software has been developed and it's already been pushed out. <laughs> by, that, by that means it's already, it's already a done deal, right? So there, there, I believe that there needs to be this conversation. So getting back to at least the, 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 the statutes that have been amended here. So the first thing is, to be able to add software engineers as a part A. So there's about 50 pages where I insert what a software engineer is, what their roles are, and how they're similar to all the other professional engineers who must also um, you know, take an ethics and a professionalism component and also uh, as part of their exam, but also for their continuing education. So if we can scroll down just a bit more, there's um, several hundred pages. I mean, there's several, there's several pages, there's a hundred pages in all, but you can kind of see, we want to get to the part B. So we're going to have to scroll down a little bit more. A vigorous scrolling would, yeah. So a lot of the reds are going to be the amendments that I added to the existing law. That would be great if we can use this as a focal point for a conversation within a committee, maybe by ACM. There's software engineering defined again. We're gonna keep scrolling until we hit a part B. Thank you, by the way. Yeah, there's a lot of amendments. <laughs> Oh, the yellow actually shows the ethical implementations of the law. So they're talking about fraud, breach, deceit, you know. Um, so by virtue, even the uh, engineers, I, I wanted this highlight to at least show that um, by virtue of just even the laws in itself, a licensed engineer definitely needs to uphold the the um, highest possible ethical and professional conditions as a component of getting this license from the state, right? So again, lawyers license, doctors are given licenses by the state. Um, every Electricians are even given licenses by the state. But of course, there needs to be this um, obligation that, in, in, that they must be able to uphold to maintain their license. Thank you, by the way. Let's forward to B. We'll get there. It's a long law. There we go. So amendment B is, okay, so the important thing is uh, to re realize this. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. So there is the professionals. There's two sets of this law that required amendments. The first one, which is the easiest of the two, is to be able to um, just insert and abridge to include software professionals as engineers, right? 
if if um, there's a similar law, there's like I mentioned with geologists and surveyors, that is apart from the in the other uh, engineering law that we just saw. But both of them, both the geologists and the engineering law, both report to this board of regulations. And that we can find also on the website. So basically this governing board is a state, it's like a state agency, just like the bar, state bar for lawyers has a state agency. It's a very small community of, um, of, of workers in the government, but they are, they are really responsible for a few things. One is administering the exam of professional licensure, in this case for engineers, and for geologists and surveyors. So um, they're also, um, in addition to the exam, if there's any disciplinary actions, for example, if lawyers commit, you know, malpractice, you may have heard, or a doctor commits malpractice. Well, guess what? That's a disciplinary action. And guess who looks at that? The board. And what does the board do? They take away your license for a limited amount of time or maybe a permanent amount of time. But at the end of the day, if that's your livelihood, you're gonna, you're gonna definitely not want that to happen, right? So that's kind of what the board does. Um, that's some of their other roles, right? Um, but the board also helps design at least they, uh, what the exams should look like and hopefully as maybe a committee in ACM, we can provide some, if the law is allowed, we can provide what sort of ethics or ethical rules we would like to have tested, right? Or what sort of ethics and ethical rules that happen a lot in practice that we wanna be educated on a yearly basis on, right? So that's what the board does primarily. And of course, oh, lastly, which is important for them is they collect the, the fees. I think for, for a renewal for a license for an engineer is like on a yearly basis is 50 or 60 bucks. For, for a lawyer, it's anywhere between 200 to 800 bucks a year. But um, that's, that's a different story. That's a requirement. Um, but that's kind of what the board does. But by the same token though, is if the legislature or if the government or hopefully on behalf of the people, right? If there are some things or some instances that maybe there was a data breach and there was a lesson and so they rewrote a law and maybe they, uh, the, go the governor wants to, to test on, you know, certain aspects of the law in the ex entrance exam, right? Um, that's one way to be able to um, reach into the end to create this dialogue of lawmakers with software professionals, just as they do with engineers, just as they do with all the other licensing boards that are out there, okay? So, um, so again, in the best case is, all, I all we have to do is just edit the engineer, Professional Engineers Act, or maybe in the worst case, there's a part C where we would have to, if they're not, if the law, if the um, legislatures don't necessarily like that idea, there needs to be a completely new act for software professionals, very much like a geologist act, right? So it would be another component, but so long as they're regulated by this board of professional um, regulations here. With I think this is the key one. This board here is important because they deal with a lot of technical folks. Um, so, in fact, a lot of the board members and a lot of the regulators are technical people in, in of themselves, and they actually are representatives. So, for example, there is an electrical engineer on the board, and there's a, you know, there's a mechanical engineer, so hopefully there's a software engineer on the board, and they're full-time, and they're, you know, they, all they do is they kind of um, help with the exams, administer the exams, they also answer any ethical questions and hotlines. There's a whole lot of things, right? But this dialogue right now as it is, is not happening. 
I think I think this is not the end all of being able to implement digital privacy and digital ethics, but it is one way to be able to contribute and I think a meaningful way because at the end of the day, software professionals are at the very heart of creating the digital world, right? And who knows best in my opinion, right? Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of the, the, out, the outline, right? A lot of it here is the actual website. Um, so there's, uh, the website is up. Uh, take a look at it, folks, when you get around to it. Um, if you're interested, the key thing is to potentially uh, look at the proposed legislation of what I discussed, right? Um, if, if that's something you wanna be able to look at, at at a granular level, it's all there. There's also a white paper that's also gonna be published uh, the end of this year too in a law journal, but it kind of lays out this discussion that I, this monologue that I just had. Um, but part of the present, most of the presentation is I wanna break in for questions and answers as soon as we can. But that paper is pretty much kind of outlines everything as it is now. Um, in the law world, I, it is it for the most part it, it is it is being accepted. It's being published, but I can tell you, I'd say maybe thirty percent of the lawyers are very, very upset about it, in the sense that they don't want to lose the power or the, or the to their control, I think, on a lot of things in terms of digital privacy, as there are now digital privacy lawyers, I really believe that a, a, a software professional can do just as good a job as a lawyer could who is licensed. And so that's another thing that I wanted to convey too, is the first thing is if we're lucky enough to get that license enacted into law, that's great. The second thing though is, um, and this also has a lot to do with my own personal experience as a patent attorney. Patent attorneys work alongside with patent agents. Guess what? Patent agents take the bar, but they're not attorneys. They're actually technical experts, right? So they may be like, a, say, a mechanical engineer, computer scientist can sit for the patent bar, take the patent bar, practice law within the patent office, but they're not lawyers. That's, in a, that's a rare exception. And um, most general lawyers that are not patent attorneys just are not used to that and they don't wanna share. That's I think what's is ca causing a lot of ruckus right now. But I can assure you that technical, I, I myself am a technical folk, right? But technical folks do a very good job, a very meticulous job. There's nothing in the law that's magic as long as they pass the bar, guess what? The patent agents do work alongside patent attorneys very well, if not better. And so my thought is, what would be really interesting is, um, a step two is with the professional license, how could they also work alongside data, um, privacy lawyers, right? Um, maybe kind of like a paralegal, right? Or even better, they're, they're a lot, just like a patent agent. So they can be a digital privacy agent. They can work side alongside them for uh, being able to enforce laws, to be able to work with law enforcement, like the attorney general, to be able to see on the ground and to point out and to potentially enforce data privacy laws. So Rafa, yes. Um, I don't know. Can you see on your screen this uh, question from the Q and A? Oh, I can. You please let me know. Yeah, it's there on the Q and A. Oh. Do, can you see that? I can see a little bit of it. Um, let me just see here. I can. I can read it, but it's kind of long. You might want to take a look at it. Yeah, it's a little long. Let's see. What is your vision for hotlines. I've been working on a pervasive widespread software bug introduced over 30 years ago 
in an academic paper, which has led to discrimination against immigrants to countries including the UK and Austria, Australia. Uh, my attempts to raise the issue with the companies involved has resulted in silence. How can I report the ethics related software bug in a way that companies are incentivized to correct it? So let me, I, I don't know if I completely understand the question. I, I think he's asking, how can he report this particular bug that he's, uh, which he feels is, uh, leads to discrimination. And he's wondering how he can uh, report that discrimination against immigrants. Hmm. Uh, Ralph? I would, I would think that uh, perhaps part of the, this is uh, kind of relates back to what you were saying that if there is a law and some training goes along with it, I remember you saying that uh, the licensed professionals would know what to do in a situation like this. That's, that's part of it. The other thing too right now is there is no, there is no accountability, right? I, I think that's what I'm having a trouble answering the question because uh, a lot of government entities, there's no, I think this goes back to what you're saying too, Bill, is that there's no um, accountability, but there's no really laws that are written into this. So there, there are other, there are ways to, um, there are ways to bring it, bring the concern to immigration in the context of an immigration lawyer, right? Or an immigration lawyer, depending on what country it is. But that really doesn't go to the heart of the matter, right? Because ultimately, you can report on it after the fact. But what happens if it pops up in other places around the, around the world, for that matter, right? There is no, what we're talking about right now is kind of in this gray area of this Wild West. And I'm very sorry that Jim has had to deal with this for over 30 years. Um, the answer is simply is there, depending on the state of where he's at, it would have to be an immigration law question, right? To a, to a lawyer to bring up the concern or maybe to an attorney general, depending on what, um, what, what governing regime the particular nation is under, right? But uh, there is nothing out there for a kind of a cohesive cyber reporting, but I think that could also, if you, it, that also segues into what I was about to say, is that why am I picking on California, right? Why are we talking about California? And I think this kind of goes to Jim's question too, is because in the digital world, there's no, there's sometimes there's no state, right? State in the sense, not in a state machine sense, no, state in the sense of a government, right? A, a way to regulate this, right? And that's what, that's this very issue that we're having this grappling of where there's no venue. Most lawyers, in fact, if not all lawyers with the exception of patent attorneys have no technical background. So they, this is not in their radar. And that's why we see year after year or even month after month why they're called up the Capitol Hill, but the, the lawmakers are very confounded. But here, here's the magic. And this is what I believe that the Digital Deputy Act can help as we're, we're charting in completely uncharted territory, but California can be the first. And why? Because at the end of the day, Silicon Valley is at the heart of the world software industry, period. So we're at a very fortunate situation being, being able to change a law in just the state of California. We're not even talking about going to Washington DC or even going to the United Nations. We can change the law of the state of California and by virtue of it being at the hub of the software world, one way or another, there, 
one company is tied to Silicon Valley, right? One way or another, that is enough legal nexus to kind of bring this idea of a licensure into play and it to, to create the, a, a template to be used not only in, in this state, but definitely all the other states in the US. And of course, um, I don't know where Jim is from, but I assume he's from a Commonwealth country, the same, right? Um, but as it is now, the answer would be a lawyer, but I, I really think there are other ways to kind of skin a cat. I don't know if that answers the question, but so the beauty of the Digital Deputy Act is to be able, the first thing is uh, if you're interested is to create a committee so that we can work on creating this act so that we can bring it to our local, if, if you're a resident of California, our local representatives, they listen to people in numbers who have a game plan, right? That we can bring this idea of a licensure this has never happened before anywhere. So this is all very, and it's going to require a lot of educating. But the key thing is that this is a wonderful avenue for all of us to, especially ACM, has been working on digital ethics way before, I mean, way before even the internet, right? For that matter. This is a wonderful way to kind of implement digital ethics to where where it actually rubber meets the road and bringing it into a legal conversation. So Rafa, yes, uh, the um, uh, you you mentioned about uh, uh, California residents. Uh, would you say that uh, you are open to having uh, people who are not residents of California? also be members of the committee uh, to, to input their ideas? I think that would be a wonderful idea. I am just, um, I am just a member of ACM. I think that would be up to the board of ACM Bay Area. Um, I don't wanna overstep my bounds, but as a committee member, a, a potential committee, well, I'm a member of ACM, but as a member, I would have no objection to it. I think that would be a great idea because at the end of the day, this is completely uncharted territory. Um, oh, I'm, I'm is, just, I'm just trying to. Thank see you. Whether you, um, you would. Uh, no objection. You're right. So you, you, so you're, you're, the contact form that you have on the website, uh, you certainly would uh, welcome people from outside of California uh, signing up on that as well. Please. Okay. And, and that is the, uh, that's kind of the point of this contact form, I think, am I right? Is, yeah. Uh, okay. No, I, I greatly appreciate it. As lawyers get to talking and rambling too much, and thank you for, for <laughs> focusing me on to what really matters, right? And I greatly appreciate it. Um, Definitely, that's what the contact form is. I mean, uh, once we get some some legislators that are really going to hear us and what we want and how we as software professionals want to be invited to that conversation, along with lawyers, law enforcement, um, everyone else, it's it's just if it, if I didn't if I didn't encounter it when I was doing a lot of the big data tooling. As a student, I never would have guessed, but it's just remarkable how software professionals aren't aren't mentioned in any of these laws. I don't, I don't understand why. I don't, and it shouldn't have to be that way. We're we're the builders, right? It, yep. It, it uh, makes no um, sense. So, uh, if I may interject a couple of more comments here. First of all, uh, with uh, the comment from uh, the question from Jim, uh, it seemed like it, what it brought to my mind was that if the kinds of things that you're talking about, uh, professional engineering certification uh, had been in place when this bug was first introduced, then the 
engineers who observed that would have had a place, you know, a some guidelines uh, about uh, whether it was ethical or not, and and where to go to do and something. Where to report? It. You know, and, a really. Uh, there's a, another question here, or a comment, really, from uh, Carl Anderson. I don't know if you see that one in the Q and A where he's saying that uh, Texas had a professional engineer, software engineering exam. I am not, and I'm a Texas lawyer, but I'm not a Texas <laughs> professional engineer. Well, it was, it was discontinued <laughs> in 2019, Carl says. Carl is a real uh, amazing- uh, I did uh, not. On the internet finding chat. all kinds of, you know, yeah. if you have oh. to dig for something, Carl's the guy, he, he finds it. Anyway, he uh, he has a a uh, pointer to that too, I guess. You know, that's really interesting, Carl. Although it's Texas, and we know North Texas and even Austin has a lot of um, tech presence, but I think for it to real, I, I'm hopeful in the sense that for it to really take off, it has to happen in the Hollywood of tech which is in Silicon Valley. I think from a practical standpoint, for it to kind of have a, a global effect beyond the state of California. <coughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if Texas is arguably, you know, Austin has grown in the last 10 years remarkably, but it's not yet Silicon Valley. That's very, very good. I, 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 I like that idea. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Oh, so, um, I, I, so I guess the, the one thing too, at least with what Jim is saying in terms of the hotlines, right? So at the end of the day is if we had an exam, if we had some semblances of an exam, that would be a place to report. One example that comes to mind too is this happened with the, um, the uh, Boeing, right? Where the, it was actually the software engineers and also, I would suspect the mechanical and aerospace engineers, too, had maybe warned about the, the, and it was shown to be that it was a fact, right? They had warned the higher, uh, uh, higher ups that there was a problem with the, the MAX 800, right? But it was the executives who overrode that. And they're in a heap and hollering bunch of trouble right now right but the professional engineers did their duty as far as i know and they did alert the higher ups um sometimes but that a lot of these things could be you know if it was not just with boeing but other projects around silicon valley and the different companies that are involved if there was a mechanism for being able to report these activities, I believe there could be maybe some more consistency and, oh, and making the, the digital world a lot less Wild West. Um, that's, I guess, the, the follow-up on that comment. So uh, can you see uh, on the screen, I've put up uh, some things from the chat and so there are several comments uh, here in the chat. Uh, let's see, for one thing, um, let's see, I think it was uh, Jim Solomon said he was from uh, Mountain View, California. And Ke Kevin Tucker listed a, uh, an organization, I guess it's the Electronic Freedom Frontier, EFF.org. 
which apparently has some web pages related to legal assistance. I don't know if you can see all that. Uh, I do. Uh, okay. So um, this is one of the benefits of a of a interactive talk like this is. Yeah. Not only do you get to present a lot of things, but you get to get some interesting feedback from the participants. I think I do appreciate Kevin's comment. I think the cyber lawyers are great, but to be honest, I'm not talking. I think it's it's about time, in my opinion, not just to have the lawyers involved. I really sincerely believe that software professionals in of themselves are capable. And if they need to take a license exam, by all means do it. But I think they should also be a conduit of being able to implement a lot of these. I, I, I think a lot of it can go, again, I'm, I'm just amazed of when from my daily practice as a patent attorney, where I see patent agents, I'm not, I'm not um, bound to where who is a lawyer and who is not ultimately if you pass the patent bar, right? I'm, I'm kind of more geared towards my comp, my comments would be more geared towards it. I appreciate the, that there's the electronic frontier foundation and with cyber lawyers, but I think also it would be great to see software professionals being educated and being able to also to be a source of, uh, a wealth of information on that topic as well, to be able to empower themselves as a profession. Um, I think that's important. And I, th I think at the end of the day, that's gonna make a big difference more so than I'll say it than cyber lawyers, because at the end of the day, we all know with every time we go through a life cycle, every time we're software developers are the ones that actually create the very environments that the entire world is in on a daily basis for many things, right? From banking to Netflix to everything. So that's my two cents, my, my conversation, but I do appreciate the, the comment. Um, as you were saying, Bill, I'm sorry. Uh, well, I, I see, um that um, Liana was asking Jim whether he wanted to actually be unmuted and uh, say say some things. Um, and uh, he's responded with some comments, but I'm not sure about, uh, oh, okay, he says, sure. So let's see if we can accomplish that. Uh, if we can, let's see here. Um, here, uh, there, I think, right? Hello? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Well, thank you. I, yes, I was the one who sent that question in and have been commenting on the chat. I have been working on this bug uh, for 30, well, I haven't been working on it for 30 years. I only learned it existed um, about six years ago, but it is a speech recognition uh, for pronunciation assessment bug, which is, uh, it goes to the Pearson. I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Pearson Limited of London, England. They're an educational software company and they have a, a subsidiary they purchased uh, out of uh, Menlo Park, um, Versant, uh, which they, re uh, uh, it was originally called Ordnate and they renamed it as Versant. And it provides uh, English pronunciation fluency evaluations. You basically you get a, a printout, you uh -oh. get a one page piece of paper and you call up a phone number and it asks you questions and you respond and it decides whether or not you speak English uh, proficiently or not. But unfortunately it uses um, a method of evaluation based on the, pro uh, pardon the technical terms, but it uses the posterior probabilities of hidden Markov models instead of a legitimate modeling of what is and is not intelligible. So instead of uh, playing audio to a bunch of listeners and asking them to type in what they thought they heard, they just trust the speech recognition system to give them a probability, which it turns out to be context independent. So 
if you say context or content, the, the difference between the N and the T is influenced by the neighboring phonemes. And so what happens is professional immigrants to Australia, for example, there's a, um, you can easily find an article about a veterinarian who tried to immig immigrate to Australia, tried to get a green card after being a, a married resident, um, married to an Australian citizen for 10 years. She tried to get her green card and she could not pass the pronunciation fluency test because per, uh, Pearson, Versant, or Ordnant was using this old 1989 model of what good pronunciation is supposed to be that really has no, uh, it has a very weak correlation to what you and I consider to be intelligible speech. And um, a professional um, radio announcer from Singapore was also denied uh, immigration status because of this test and over 9,000 immigrants to the United Kingdom had their uh, their um, immigration status put at risks and 2,000 of those 9,000 were actually deported back to the Caribbean where they had come from because of this bug. Now I have contact, uh, this bug is, is in um, uh, a very large number of company. You probably know about Rosetta Stone, for example, um, I'm familiar with Pearson. Um, I know they do a lot of the, the testing even here in the U.S., right? For uh, interpretation testing, right? Yeah. Well, I would love to tell you more about this. I signed up on your website. I went to the, um, the digitaldeputyact.org slash contact form and I signed up and I'm happy to provide all the details about that as you'd like and hopefully maybe something can come of that. Oh, definitely. To answer your question initially, let me ask you this really quickly. Um, was Pearson, as you did indicate, they're a huge company and they're out of the UK, right? They have an office in the East Coast somewhere too, right? Um, but uh, being from the UK, do you, were you, did you actually contact the company in of itself or repeatedly and um the like i say they acquired the company from menlo park that has this bug the people who committed the bug were the authors of this 1989 paper um and uh it, it, it's huh. i've contacted pearson rosetta stone microsoft which also has a pronunciation assessment system which is used extensively throughout china and is very low quality um uh, google has a uh, a new system for uh, out of Tel Aviv, the search group, uh, Google search group in Tel Aviv, Israel has a um, practice your pronunciation application with the same bug in it. Um, but it of course, that's not a high stakes uh, situation. No, the really high still, stakes yeah, it kind of has disseminated to a lot of other venues, right? Unfortunately. Well, you know, this, this uh, particular bug, I think, uh, highlights the uh, usefulness of the kinds of things that Rafa is talking about. You know, the one particular bug, it's like anything else, you know, uh, we may know of a particular case of something uh, that we uh, uh, are, feel is, is regrettable, but, you know, if we can solve the general case, uh, then we can stop many things uh, from being regrettable. If I'm, I hope I'm making myself clear. You are making yourself very clear. And I agree with you both. I mean, right now, the only means for this, I, I'm, I, I'm sitting, remember, I'm a mashup guy, right? So I'm sitting as a, in putting my lawyer hat on. And the only recourse is I can see why maybe they were not paying attention. But you know, if you, you have the, again, the, the licensure of a lawyer signing behind the letter, gentleman or Pearson, it has come to our attention that you have this bug, you know, it is, you know, it is having some adverse effects, uh, you know, there's. Well, they, they already got, let me, let me just say, they got pilloried in the press. You can, uh, you can look this up in the financial times. I'll try to post some URLs into chat, but um the interesting the, thing the is companies have been pilloried in the press, but they refuse to do anything. There's no accountability. There you go. 
And see, my hope is that I want to include people like, I think the Digital Deputy Act is I would love to have it. And yes, let's have this conversation offline as well. I have no problem in, in talking to you, but this is a really good example because I would want someone like you as say maybe a digital professional who would know you can't always rely on other professionals, right? Or in this case, yes, you, you could potentially think about a lawyer, but if there's a licensure, there's also should be some other mechanisms for reporting things ethically as a developer um, so that people actually pay attention to in a legal sense, right? Um, I can imagine how frustrated you must be because at the end of the day, these are, these are dire life life kind of things that are happening to a lot of these immigrants who would otherwise wish to, to go to these countries but are forbidden because of a bug. So Rafa, um, Tom Moran, who is another of our core uh, SFA ACM members, um, has posted a, something here in the Q&A where he says, um, there is the, uh, the idea of uh, misprision I think is how to pronounce. Uh, it can be a crime to know about a crime and fail to stop it or report it. And uh, I suppose that would, um, you know, Jim ha has done his due diligence of reporting it in spades, it sounds like, you know, just over and over. Uh, but uh, perhaps that could also be some kind of of lever against uh, Pearson, although if there have already been uh, uh, may you know publicly been uh, scolded about it, then uh, perhaps they're not really uh, all that interested. But uh, what do you think of this idea of uh, misprision? Is that something that your legal background uh, can speak to? I think that was the very heart of why I, why I got on this digital deputy journey, right? Um, um, web scraping in of itself is not always legal. <laughs> I, I mean, I hate to say it, right? Um, with the existing privacy laws that are out there, although I was the only person that knew about that, right? Ultimately, I think as Tom had mentioned, we, as software professionals, I think Jim's case is a good case, right? But there are so many other cases that deal with data privacy, whether it's health privacy, whether it's financial records, whether it's data that's being harvested or resold. Um, if, if, if there's a mechanism I mean, at the, at the end of the day right now, it's um, the only accountability is the CEO, you know, goes to Congress and they talk about it, that they're going to change. And yeah, they do change to an extent, but most of the eyes and the ears are the software professionals, right? And, but at the end of the day, there's, there's no, there's no true mechanism or, or in, in Tom's case, there's, there's no um, accountability or there's no, there is no mechanism to, to report. Okay, I see, uh, look, there's some more URLs that um, I think Jim is posting in the chat here. Uh, and uh, I think the chat, yeah, he's posting them to all see, I think to all uh, attendees. So that should be available and visible to everyone. And uh, I believe there's a, a uh, little menu down at the bottom of the chat, little three dots type menu, where you can probably save the chat locally on your uh, computer if you want to uh, do that and, you know, and, and review those links later. Thank, thank you, Bill. Just 
kind of saying that for everybody, yeah. everybody's benefit. Uh, since you've gotten this whole thing started, Rafa, I mean, there's a, you know, uh, obviously some uh, back and forth and interesting discussion going on. Well, well, thank you. And I'm, I'm here to, I mean, answer questions now, but also, right, if there's any other questions, the Digital Deputy Act is um, the website. And ultimately, if we get a committee going in ACM, this can be, uh, this can be not just an effort within just software professionals, but we can hopefully use it as a movement or a mechanism to to implement these laws to bring software professionals as part of this conversation with digital ethics, with digital privacy, with digital professionalism, to make that a, um, how to, to win the wild west, right? As they say, to settle the wild west. Okay, and just, just to clarify, um, again, the, uh, the, contact us form is for any interested parties. Uh, they don't need to be a, an ACM member or a resident of California. They can be a resident of anywhere in the world and they don't need to be an ACM member. Uh, you're just trying to gather uh, uh, like-minded folks together to work on this, I believe. Yes, um, definitely. Um, although we would want you know, ACM members as well to, to be able oh, to yeah, participate yeah, yeah, this sure. on an ongoing basis so that um, I know we have a code of ethics, right? And that has been implemented, but um, we want to put some more teeth to that. We want to make it legal. At least I, 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 I do, or my, my vision says that is to kind of put some teeth and um, kind of make it more effective and, and as one of many potential ways, but this is just one way that I, that to me seems very obvious, just only from my experience, right? That um, if implemented, it could have a very practical effect, but it could also have a very, a positive effect to kind of um, add some, more accountability or, and also some standards within how to report or, or even standards of professionalism with, within us, right? As mm -hmm. a group, as a professional group. Sure. All right, well, uh, are there any other uh, questions coming up? Let's see, do we have, uh, let's see, and Carl, Oh yeah, Carl posted the general, the link to the ethics uh, at the ACM website, the international ACM website. And I don't see any more in Q and A. Oh, wow. Yeah, there's the ethics. I looked at that too the other day. Thank you, by the way. Uh, that's Carl again. Uh, yeah. I'm going to save that. Thank you. All right. Well, anyone else have any more questions for Rafa or any more discussion or hi, Mike, uh, do you have any more uh, remarks on your part? My, my general remark is that um, I, I think it's a very exciting thing because um, maybe the analogy is like disease. If, um, if problems can be handled at the factory where the software engineers are making things, um, you're really grabbing it at the right time. I mean, lawyers kind of get it after the damage is done. So, I mean, I know that, um, you know, Jim has expressed a lot of, uh, uh, or has shown a lot of cases where, where the damage is done, but I think um, the dream is to nip it in the bud and, um, you know, involve the software engineer engineering community. Oh, thank you, Mike. That makes my day because that's exactly the sentiment and the exact message that I was hoping to provide this evening. Um, I, I truly believe that um, from a practical sense. And if I can empower software professionals along the way too, it, beyond licensure, 
if I can have them in sort of like a quasi lawyer setting within the context of digital privacy, digital ethics and digital professionalism to act as digital deputies alongside lawyers, alongside law enforcement, I think that would be really cool. Um, I think that is one, in my opinion, one viable avenue. And I don't, I would, I would love to share, you know, power, legal power with software professionals. And the reason being is that I've, I've seen it already work with, with patent agents in the sense that patent agents, again, they're not lawyers, but they're technical people. They're completely competent. They, they know the law inside and out. They pass the bar. You know, it's good enough. That, that's well, my opinion from a practical standpoint. I, I see another uh, entry in Q&A from Carl. Uh, and I, I think he's perhaps implying the answer with the question there. Um, you know, I think that uh, it's my, my opinion anyway, though, but perhaps you would want to uh, say something about it, Rafa, before we wrap up. Do you see the question? How does this relate oh, to devices yeah. with software? Um, the way I at least interpret it, right, is that, well, first of all, there's, uh, there's, there's medical, well, there's medical privacy that's also involved, right? There's the HIPAA compliance, right? When HIPAA high tech for even taking the data to create algorithms for a lot of these devices in themselves, right? There's, there's how many, I, I guess as a software professional, you're not necessarily educated in HIPAA compliance, right? That's a good, that's a good law though. And at the end of the day, by gum, we can, we can have an education class for for your licensure on HIPAA compliance and have you learn about it so that you're a better for so that you're a better developer right and you know the nuances of privacy law just even in the basis of building software algorithms for these devices right or firmware the more the more you learn and the more you know even if it's not software related right it's going to go back and it's going to make you a better developer. You're going to be I, more I, informed. I could, I could see there being uh, some kind of subspecialty for uh, HIPAA compliance within the, uh, within this framework. I think even Liana had mentioned counterfeit at some point, right, Liana? Um, where you have to l learn some sort of um, some, some definite laws and codes as well. So with financial records, right? Or with financial data, that, that could also be a subspecialty. But that, that's, all, that's all for us to figure out. But uh, definitely um, as a group, as part of the ACM, law, lawmakers are not gonna pay attention unless we kind of speak as a group. And also we advocate, this is what we want because we want to be part of this conversation. It makes sense to be part of this conversation. We shouldn't be excluded from the law <laughs> as it is today, which is just remarkable. I can't, I still can't get my head wrapped around it. And, and Jim is a perfect example. There's just these gaps where we can't do anything as software developers right now. Okay, uh, Liana, did you want to speak to that question that Rafa had asked about what you'd said about counterfeiting? Oh, uh, I think that there, there are too many things on that and so many details. I don't think I have time to <laughs> enumerate them. The question is, uh, I would say, uh, like what I was suggesting to, uh, to Jim, uh, let's start on his website and start to put some of these uh, obvious cases. Let's put that together and see what we can sort out from them. Let's do a human learning instead of machine learning first. <laughs> uh, that's basically what I'm saying. And so we may have see some of those cases. To me, it's really is uh, between 
the gray area do we want to uh, clarify black or white, or we want to keep it as a gray area, which is a lot of people really, really want to do. And that's probably what's the, what's the uh, situation Jim was talking about. Uh, you start hitting on them, and they don't really answer. And this, some of the cases, even worse for me, just basic data, I was a, a question to this, uh, to, to this uh, uh, annual survey type of thing. Uh, according, to, according to our um, the, the uh, EPA data. And now the question is, when I query the question to this department and they won't get their PhD uh, directors to answer, they got a PhD student to answer me, that basically say nothing. <laughs> uh, so, and also they don't really publish that. They just leave that as for the corporation to do their own data publication and for the, their own credibility. And instead of the look at the real data of our uh, EPA were collected and then not talk about it. So why they don't talk about it? And to me, it's quite obvious uh, they go into the politics to, to touching somebody in there. Uh, this is a kind of question we really need to discuss. Uh, somewhere we could leave it gray into the hand of the people who are in control. That may be a committee, uh, that may be one or two person. Uh, we don't know that, but to, for our software engineer, we like to have a little bit clear definition of it, uh, see if we can blame the whole committee, then we can do it. <laughs> well, in any case, uh, you know, I mean, so it sounds like you've run into something, Jim has run into something, Rafa, yep. you had mentioned some things, uh, examples, there are examples all over the map uh, of, right. of issues, legal. Right. Yeah. So as a software engineer, we just needed to find some of the basics and what we can do, uh, you know, uh, that lets us sort out of something. And I think uh, what's the, uh, Rafa's in the, uh, the writing of the, or modification of the current law is a really nice place to start it. Uh, so that we can start to look at that and uh, start uh, mapping things we actually able to do. Uh, so at least to, if we can make that into a law, at least we make that into a best, best practice and for people to actually be able to look through it. Maybe, maybe yeah. look at it like something like a Wikipedia page. <laughs> uh. my, my hope is definite. Thank you, Liana. My hope is definitely to make it a law. I think, um, and I want to add one comment is that everything you said is dead on. And lawyers work within the gray area, but that, that, that's a cultural, a professional cultural difference, right? Lawyers work within the gray areas, but those software engineers don't necessarily need all that gray. And I think also software engineers, because software is used by everyone on the planet every given day, they, the, the public also needs to know, in addition to software engineers, what, should, what is gray should no longer be gray, right? We're getting in trouble over and over again with data breach after data breach. So, and I, I, I'm in the general sense, not software engineers, and, and, but people, companies are getting in trouble with data breaches. There's, there needs to be better communication and software engineers need to be at the table included with all of those CEOs, lawmakers, lawyers, every. Yes, I think I think we we can start somewhere. Uh, for example, ownership. Uh, ownership that's a capture where the data to be responsible by the owner. 
uh, to the users or who will use it. So we could define that in that ownership from that point of view, which is where you call the uh, data, uh, the digital deputy uh, act supposed to act to clarify. So who is the owner? Who is in charge of it? And what can we do on particular item and what we will do or we're not supposed to do, right? right. To make that so simple, clear, and so that we can actually to say, yeah, we can do machine learning now. And that if we don't have the definition of it, we can do anything about it. And just everybody have to be puzzled all the time, right? Okay, well, uh, I think that um, we uh, certainly um, got a lot of information and exchanged information uh, tonight. Uh, uh, and uh, Raphael, or if, any, if anybody has any last comments, uh, if not, then uh, perhaps we can just wrap it up here. Okay. Thank well, you very much. Well, thank you, Rafa, for coming on and, and giving this. And uh, also thanks to Bill Liu of AI Camp for providing the Zoom session for us. And uh, we look forward to uh, continuing to work with you, Rafa, and uh, with you, Bill. And uh, thanks to all the members of the ACM uh, uh, Council, Liana and Mike and Tom and and uh, Greg and so on. And I guess with that, uh, I think I will leave the meeting myself. And right. uh, well, thank you and happy Thanksgiving, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, happy, happy, safe from COVID Thanksgiving, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, let's see, Bill, uh, Lou, I guess you can uh, be the one to end the meeting here. I'm going to leave the meeting myself. Uh, I, I would ask uh, Bill Lou to have a copy of all this chat and the Q&A session and send it to uh, us and uh, Rafa so he maybe want to review it and uh, do something on the website. I think that's a good start point. Is the bill loose still there? Okay, well, seems I would say, thank you everybody, I'm out. <laughs> Me too, bye. Bye-bye.